Holy Spirit, we thank you for loving us. Um, I love the fact that we don't have to beg you to be present and to do anything because we wouldn't be here had you not already been at work. So we anticipate greater blessing. And we invite that, especially in terms of the revelation of Jesus in us. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, again in this session to blow our minds. And we give ourselves to you in joy. Thank you for revealing Jesus, not only to us, but in us. And we will have more, please. In Jesus' name, amen. This is an icon that I discovered recently, and I discovered that it's actually a Western icon, according to Brad. Uh, I, I'm not, it's, I think, Italian. Uh, it's difficult to see a little bit of it, but what's striking about it is that Jesus is on the cross, and the Father is behind him, holding the cross. And if you look above Jesus' head, there's a little white thing that looks a little bit like a wishbone almost. That would be the Holy Spirit. I think that's the gospel. And I want to show you in John's gospel, um, I want to work through what he's doing, how he's leading us to discover what the cross is all about. But before we do that, I want to run through a few scriptures from uh, the other gospels. When I was in seminary many years ago now, um, I got this idea, I reckon where this came from. I got this idea to read through the four Gospels and to see what they, they tell us about the reason for Jesus' death. Because like uh, Brad and many of you, I grew up in a situation where we were told that what's going on on the cross is that Jesus goes to the cross and the Father places the sin of the world on Jesus and then punishes Jesus instead of us. In fact, turns his back upon Jesus, pours out his wrath upon him. And one question I always had, even as a little boy, about that model, even if you accepted that, then why do we still talk about the wrath of God? I mean, either it was extinguished in Jesus or it's not. You know, so even, it just didn't make any sense to me on that level, but it didn't make any sense to me either, even, even as a little boy, that this relationship is that um, easily broken. So I read through the Gospels and I said, I wanna see what they, they tell us. And so I'll run through some of the verses with you. Um, to show us. This is the first in Luke 9. Let these words, this is Jesus, let these words sink into your ears for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. That's a no frills kind of comment. But I was a bit surprised because I, I kept thinking I was going to run across the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem and the Father is going to pour out his wrath upon him and his wrath will be satisfied. But again and again and again and again, all, in all the Gospels, you see this kind of statement. That's, that's, he's going to be delivered into the hands of the sons of men. Next up, verse, please. From that time, Jesus, it's Matthew, be, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised up on the third day. So now you've moved from handed to men to some definition not just men, but men in Jerusalem, elders and chief priests and scribes, and, and he's going to be killed. Keep going, please. Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So you not only have scribes and elders of, and the leaders of Israel not only condemning Jesus, but now he's being handed over to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are going to mock and scourge and crucify him and on the third day he will be raised up. That, just a brief, a quick snippet. How humble is Jesus Christ? He, everybody on earth is breathing Christological air and he is going to allow them to mock him. Spit on him. And the scourge, of course, is utterly brutal. That, I don't know if it's a cat of nine tails, but it had many, um, that whip had lead and glass bits and it would come all the way around his body and when it, when it pulled back, it just ripped flesh off. So 39 of these lashes, Jesus is bleeding out even before the cross. Keep, keep going, please. Then he came to the disciples and said to him, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. 
Now, the most famous sermon in American history, Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Again, one day it sort of hit me. What if we have it backwards? What if we have it backwards? What if the issue here is not sinners in the hands of an angry God? What if the issue is God submitting himself to the hands of angry sinners? Because this Jesus here cannot bear for us to be created and alive in his world and not know what he knows and not know the Holy Spirit. And he's gonna find his way inside of our darkness. Next, please. Mark, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. Next, please. Behold, we're going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles and they will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him and three days later he will rise again. Again. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Now, I was a bit confused at this point because I'm expecting in the four Gospels to find some sort of consistent theme on Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem because the issue here is the wrath of God. It's aimed at you. That's the issue. So you expect to be able to find these passages in not just a few, I thought there would be everywhere. And what I found was the exact opposite again and again and again. Jesus is telling his disciples and they don't get it until the resurrection. He's telling his disciples what's going to happen. Next um, slide, please. This is after the resurrection. That's all right, right there. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. I think, again, John writes his gospel late. I think he is an old veteran. He's a wise old brother, has lived through a lot of spiritual battles and he's looking out over those first generation, second generation of Christian history. He's seeing profound and disastrous mistakes already being made and already in the works. And I think John is going to reach and sit down and, and reach, as it were, back into the darkness. And he's going to help us to see what is really going on in Jesus' uh, life, death, and resurrection. For John, you asked the question, why did Jesus die? He says the same thing, and, and we won't go through these verses, but um, I can give them to you later if you want, just in the interest of time. John's going to say the same thing that the other gospel writers do, but he says something, he says it in a different way. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is face to face with God in this intimate relationship in the Holy Spirit. And he said, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't understand, and the darkness doesn't comprehend or conquer. He doesn't explain where the darkness is or what, it, what the darkness is in, in, the, in verse 5. But again and again and again in his gospel, he's going to hammer this. Then he says, Jesus says, I mean, John says that the light shines in the darkness. Darkness understand. There was a man sent out from the presence of God whose name was John. He came to bear witness to the light. And I was just sitting there looking at that one day. I thought, wait a minute. If the light of the world comes, why does it need a witness? There are two reasons. One is Jesus doesn't do anything by himself. He doesn't change the water into wine. He doesn't reveal who he is without human participation. He's not going to bring healing or revelation to the nations without human participation. He's not going to, he's not going to reveal who he is without John the Baptist participating in what he's doing. That's one dimension. But the other dimension is even more scary to me, and that is John is already telling us the nature of the problem that Jesus has come to address. It's darkness, but this is how acute it is. It is so profound and so pervasive that the darkness needs, in the darkness, the light needs a witness. And John has been sent out from the presence of God to bear witness to Jesus. 
You see it? That's all right at the very beginning. It's just there. We typically read on, but it gets more and more and more intense. And John is going to build on this theme of darkness, and he's going to say some rather uh, amazing things. John the Baptist, still in chapter 1. I love this. The Jews sent out a delegation, the Pharisees, the robe religious elite. Um, they come, they want to know what John is doing out there, and they basically have this whole sort of accusation thing going, who are you? Who are you? Why are you doing these things? What seminary did you go to? By what authority? And John says, I'll tell you who I am. I'm not the Christ, I'm not Elijah, I'm not the prophet. I'm a voice, I'm a witness. Crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. And then he says, among you stands one now whom you do not know. John's saying, are you understanding the nature of the problem? We're not dealing with an absent Yahweh. We're dealing with the present Yahweh and we're dealing with a darkness that is so profound you do not see him. You do not recognize him. And he's here, not there. Among you now stands one whom you do not know. I wonder if Jesus was literally standing right there at the time. But he was announcing to them that Yahweh has come onto the scene inside our darkness and we don't see it. He keeps on building. Chapter 3. Men will not come to the light. They hate the light. They love the darkness. And they're not coming to the light because their deeds are evil. Now you've sort of moved. It's not just blindness. There's something more now about will. They will not come to the light. They hate the light, in fact, because the light exposes their games and their religiosity and their nothingness. And John's just going to keep building this thing, keep on going. The woman at the well, Jesus says, you worship that which you don't even know. What is the nature of the problem? The nature of the problem is darkness. It's blindness. And it's so profound, we cannot recognize the presence of the Lord when he's right in front of us. And we don't want to recognize the presence of the Lord while he's in front of us. It gets more and more intense. And let me read to you from John chapter 5. This is rather amazing. John doesn't pull any punches, but neither does Jesus. <laughs> Listen to this. And the Father, this is verse 37 for those of you that are reading along. And the Father who sent me has borne witness of me. You, this is to the leadership. You have neither heard his voice nor seen his form at any time. And you do not have his word abiding in you. You're not only in the dark, you're not only blind, you not only do not recognize who I, who I am, you have never heard the voice of God at any time. You've never seen his form and you do not have the word of God abiding in you. You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life and it is these that bear witness of me. And you are unwilling to come to me. Again, unwilling. So we're not dealing just with blindness, we're dealing with obstinance. There's an unwillingness here and there's a love for darkness. You're unwilling to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, just think about this. Let's just take some big time preachers in our own country and put them on the front row and let Jesus read these passages to them. You have never heard the voice of God or seen his form ever. This is how, this is the problem. You don't have the love of God in yourselves. And he says, how can you believe me when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that comes from the one and only God? Do not think that I will condemn you. The one who condemns you is Moses. For he wrote of me, but if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? That's chapter five. And it gets worse. I mean, this is like intense. John wants everybody to understand what the real problem is. It's not that God is angry at us because we're sinners. It's we cannot recognize the presence of the Lord when he's with us. And not only will we not recognize it, we are unwilling to recognize it and we don't want him. You see, that's a very different scenario than 
the whole legalistic framework where God is holy and we sin and he can't look, he's too, no, no. This is taking us right back to Genesis chapter three when Adam and Eve have fallen and they're afraid and they're projected all this stuff onto God's face and they're scared to death and they're hiding in the bushes and they are not coming out. And you can imagine this scene where Jesus himself walks in the garden, he walks over to Adam and Eve and they're down with their heads in their, in their hands, ashamed of themselves and Jesus whispers something to them and they look at Jesus and they say, you're wrong, go away. Now we're getting to the heart of the nature of the problem. It's resistance of Jesus. It's resistance of God. It's I don't want you, if you keep on pushing me, Jesus, we're gonna have a showdown. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens as John continues to develop his gospels. <laughs> my sheep hear my voice. You are not my sheep. In fact, you are of your father, the devil. I mean, these are pretty categorical statements. When you read these passages in John, you have to make a decision. You have to decide, John, option number one. John, you are wrong about the fifth verse in your gospel when you said the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Because you've just given us about 10 chapters in a row of one person after another who did in fact overcome the light. So John, we gotta rewrite your gospel there because, or we can think, wait a minute, maybe there's more going on here. Maybe I can just put that option on hold for a second. Y'all need to stand up, move around, you okay? You following me? I mean, this is, I'm getting some, some of those Lutheran stares. <laughs> That's Luther when he said whenever he preached grace, people stared at him like a cow staring at a new gate. <laughs> he, he did. Option number two is that what John has left us is a very clear and compelling statement of what's called Calvinism. There's two groups of people. These people that Jesus says are unwilling to come to him, these people that said he says they don't have the love of God in their heart, they're not seeking the glory that comes from God, they're seeking the glory that comes from their peers. These people that he says haven't heard the voice. John's saying, yep, they never were intended to hear the voice of God, they're not ever gonna hear the voice of God, these are the non-elect, even though they're the Pharisees and the religious leaders. You could interpret it that way which then you got a real problem because John from the very beginning is talking about all things being created in the Son and the love of God the Father for all creation without exception. And you've got the Samaritan people calling Jesus the savior of the world. There's all this universal cosmic vision of Jesus and the love of God in John. So it's like, dude, you are really messed up in the head. You know, you're really inconsistent here. You're telling us on the one hand that the darkness didn't overcome the light, but we've got 15 different people or groups that did overcome it and resisted it. And then on the other hand, you're telling us that God loves the world. Then you're telling us that all these people that don't have the love of God in his heart and Jesus is just telling them like it is. And let me ask you a question. Is that it? I mean, have we not known this since Genesis 3? I mean, is that it? Jesus, like, just like the prophets, he came, he preached the gospel and you didn't believe too bad. That's it. And you start looking at it that way, you start thinking, uh-oh, uh-oh. John is making sure we understand the nature of the problem. My sheep hear my voice, you are not my sheep and I have come to address that. You do not have the word of God abiding in your heart, I have come to address that problem. You do not have the love of God in your heart, I am the good shepherd and I will address the fact that you don't have the love of God in your heart. Now you're beginning to see the larger picture of John's gospel. It's dark, it's just un you're unwilling to come to me. We're gonna deal with that. So it's not Jesus is moving toward the cross because you have this encroachment of great darkness and unwillingness and it's getting so hot that they're actually plotting to kill Jesus by chapter five in John's gospel and eventually they do. And they come, you come to John chapter 17 and you hear Jesus make this comment that I read earlier. Father, I have made your name known to them and I will make it known that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. 
because your love for me and my love for you is not in them, but I have come to deal with that. And Jesus is saying, I, I, um, that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. That's back to Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve. Father, they don't want to listen to me. They are so convinced by their own sin and brokenness that they are now projecting onto you and hiding from you. They think I'm nuts, Dad. They think I have lost my mind. And the mission of Jesus Christ is to deal with the fact that we are unwilling to come to him and to deal with the fact that we do not have the word of God abiding in our hearts. I want you to see this in John. I think he's anticipating a problem that we've been wrestling with in the Western tradition for nearly 2,000 years. The issue here is not about an angry God. The issue here is about angry sinners. And how does God deal with angry sinners? How does he deal with unrepentant sinners? How does he deal with sinners whose hearts are hardened? Now listen to this. There were no, of course, in the original writings of the Gospels, as far as we know, there were no verses and chapters and no, no headings. So it, here's the text. John 17 at the end. I have made you known, I will make you known, that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. When Jesus had spoken these words, he proceeded forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden into which he himself entered and his disciples. Judas, who was betraying him, knew the place for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priest and the Pharisees, came with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things were coming upon him, proceeded forth. And he said to them, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus, the Nazarene. And he said to them, I am. And Judas, who was betraying him, was standing with them. When, therefore, he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. And in the Patmos story, John knows that he must break through Aiden's mind right here or he will never understand. That all that he has taught him will go instantly evaporate unless he breaks through right here. And so Aiden is saying, what, what, why did you move from this prayer straight into Jesus? Was that intentional? <laughs> of course, the apostle John says, well, uh, he didn't say duh, but he looked at Aiden. Of course it's intentional. You need to understand what Jesus is going to the cross for. He's going for the cross to bring his own communion with his father inside the place inside of you where you don't want him. And he's going to do it without violating your will. He's addressing the problem. You don't have the word of God abiding in your heart. This, I love this. This is so far removed from Baxter. You've got to work this thing up. This is about us beginning to discover that the word of God has made his way inside of our heart down at the bottom of our abyss and he got there by submitting to our rejection. Listen to this. He proceeds forth. He gets up from that prayer. He turns toward the valley. He's walking down the valley. He's proceeding forth. And what does John describe that is coming down that valley to him? He doesn't say a few soldiers, Judas, and a few temple police. Did you notice that he deliberately uses the word a Roman cohort? Who knows what a cohort is? You ever thought about it? How did we miss this? We missed this because we're trying to read the story as if God's angry and gonna pour out wrath on Jesus. So we go skipping right over this to get to the bloody part. John is deliberate, he dedicates an entire section to this so we won't miss it. He says a Roman cohort, that is six hundred armed soldiers, 600, with lanterns and torches and weapons. And you can see them in formation on this side, marching toward Jesus. And John says he proceeds forth. He steps right into this. And then in verse 12, it says, um, it mentions the word keliarch, commander, which is a commander of 1,000. So on this side, you've got 600 armed Roman soldiers with lanterns and torches and weapons marching toward Jesus. On this side, you have the temple police, which is the Sanhedrin's henchmen. John does not give us a number. Mark tells us that there was a multitude. I don't know what constant multitude, but it's more than 50. 
But just imagine, you got two very strange companions. Roman soldiers, temple police, armed with lanterns and torches, coming down the valley directly at Jesus. They're being led by one man, Judas the betrayer. What is John doing? Did you notice how he narrates this? It's beautiful. Jesus proceeds forth and he says, whom do you seek? And they, they mock him, Jesus, the Nazarene, because nothing good can come out of Nazareth. And Jesus responds by saying, I am, ego I me. A long time I thought, you know, Jesus probably shouted that. I don't think he shouted it. I think he whispered it. I think he stood there and says, I am. And John says, did you notice what happened? Did you notice it? I could hardly believe this is in the Bible. <laughs> they drew back and fell to the ground. 600 armed soldiers, have you ever heard of them drawing back and falling to the ground in front of anybody? And this is the temple police. They'd just soon skin you alive and, and talk to you. And there's Judas who's betraying. All of this being played out. Everybody's down on the ground. And in two or three verses later, it says this. So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Now, why do you think John puts that little wrinkle in there? <laughs> what's he trying to, what's, what question does he want you to ask as you read this story? I mean, Jesus already kicked butt and took names just by two words. I mean, what happened? How do you go from ego I me, everybody's laid out in fear that you're going to speak again and obliterate with a rod of iron. How do you go from that to just a few verses later, these guys win. And Jesus is literally bound and being head, led off to the high priest for his uh, interrogation and eventually accusation and eventually to be beaten and mocked and spit upon. John wants you to realize that what Jesus is saying is that your murderous intentions will only be fulfilled by my submission to you. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down in my own initiative. He wants you to understand that this is not about an angry God who cannot bear to look upon you until Jesus goes to the cross and he pours out his wrath and averts it so that he can then tolerate you. He wants you to understand that in the beginning was the word and the word was face to face with God. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot understand it. And so the word becomes flesh. The father sends his son inside the darkness. Says, you go to the bottom of the abyss and I've got your back. And the Holy Spirit says, I will never forsake you. We are going in. And you get down to the very pit, to the place where there is nothing but darkness. How on earth does the father's son get into that place? He gets there by submitting himself to us as a little lamb. He's going to end up on the throne of all thrones in the universe. But he gets there by submission. There is a redeeming genius here that will take your breath away and thrill your heart and heal, heal you and me in the deep places in our soul. Jesus says, I will submit, and he does. And we beat him, and we damn him, and we mock him, and we scourge him, and we curse him to the point to where he can hardly breathe. And he's carrying a cross. And all these crowds of people shouting. You know the story of the crucifixion. There's nothing beautiful about that scene at all. But it's not sinners in the hands of an angry God. It is God in the hands of angry sinners. Deliberately submitting himself. This is Yahweh. This is the Lord of Israel come in person with his father in the Holy Spirit bowing down before the treachery and the iniquity of both Roman Empire and religious system in, the, in being led by betrayal. You know the difference between transgression and iniquity? Transgression is when you break the law. And there's the sins of commission and the sins of omission. Commission is when you break the law and you do something you're not supposed to do. Omission is when you don't do something that you're supposed to do. Usually people that are real good about not, not doing something wrong, have never, they don't want to know about the omission part. <laughs> That's transgression. 
That's transgression. Iniquity is when you, in your heart, damn God. I don't want anything to do with you. Damn you, you get out of my life now. I don't want anything to do with you. I reject you. And here you have this scene where you have represent, representatives of the world, the Roman Empire, and religion come together strangely, profoundly strangely. They hate each other, and they come together in one act of iniquity. Here is an act as though a single, the human race became a single human being embodied in the person of Judas and says, we damn you. We don't want you here. You think it was bad earlier when you said the word of God's not abiding in our heart? We don't want the word of God abiding in our heart, and we will damn you, and we'll send you out embarrassed. We'll send you out crucified and naked and broken. Give him vinegar. Damn him to hell. Do you feel this? And Jesus looks at him and says, okay. Papa says, you damn my son. You kill him. I will take you down with him. This is your vote, human race. Rejection. Papa says, I will use your rejection of my son and turn it into your adoption. Turn it into the place where I accept you at your very worst. I love this. What does God want from me? What did he count on from Baxter? What's my contribution to the kingdom of God? It's not some wonderful, cranked up faith. He knew and needed only one thing from me and that's that I would betray Jesus. And the Holy Spirit's like, hmm, I will take your betrayal of Jesus, Baxter, and I will turn that into the temple where I dwell, inside of you and inside of your darkness. You can see this. That doesn't mean there's not profound pain here suffered by all three persons in this event, because there is, beyond our, un our ability to understand. But Jesus is saying, Father, I have made you known, and I'm going in. And I'm not going to stop till I get to the bottom. And I'm going to pitch my tent there at the very bottom of the abyss, at the place where no one can see anything, where the vote of the human race is rejection. I'm going right in there. And I'm going to pitch my tent. And Papa says, I'm going to be with you. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to be with you too. This is astounding. This is what we're beginning to see once we start here, like the early church did with this relationship, rather than our mythologies that Adam invented there. The submission of Jesus Christ to the world system, to the religious system, to the betrayal, is the way in which the word becomes flesh. The Apostle Paul says, he goes beyond John when he says that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. This is how Jesus Christ enters into the darkness. Because if you think about it, what we were saying earlier, the darkness is not real to God. <laughs> it's only real to our imaginations. And Jesus is not moving, if you think about this, from John's perspective and Paul's perspective, Jesus is not moving from being outside to inside. When he becomes a human being, he's not establishing a relationship with the human race. He already has one. He's not establishing a relationship with you. He already has one. You live in me, breathe and have your being in him. What he's doing is he's finding a way to take his existing relationship with you and now, and now pitch his tent inside your illusion where you cannot see his father and where the only emotion that you feel is rejected and abandonment and you lash out at God. And Jesus said, I'm going to go inside of there and I'm going to get there by submitting to you and I'm going to let you do your worst to me. In fact, it's got to be the worst. It's got to be all the venom, all the, all the anger has to be poured out, all the rage, all the wrath. Oh yeah, the cross is about wrath. It's the human race's wrath. And we poured it out on Jesus and he accepted this. And John is saying, the word becoming flesh and dwelling in us. The word becoming flesh and dwelling in us. Now think about this. Back to John 5. Jesus is squared off with the Pharisees. I don't know, there's no historical record that I know of. Maybe some of you have done research on this. There's no historical record that tells me that Saul of Tarsus was standing there in John chapter five. I expect he was in Tarsus. 
But I also expect by this time he had heard an awful lot about Jesus stirring the pot and being a member of the Sanhedrin. It would not surprise me in the least. It would not surprise me in the least if Saul of Tarsus was standing there when Jesus says, you do not have the word of God abiding in you. I cannot help but believe Jesus had this little, little grin on his face. What would later become um, apostolic swagger. So let's say Saul of Tarsus is standing right in the middle. And Jesus says, you do not have the word of God abiding in your heart. Give me three days and we'll talk again. This is astounding. I'm so proud the Apostle Paul put this in Galatians. I want you to see it. The conversion of Saul on, on the Damascus Road in the book of Acts is narrated three times. In all three, to me anyway, it appears as though Saul is saying he sees a light which is external to him from the heavens and blinds his external eyes. So I always imagine it from a distance. Fits into the Western mindset. God's up there, we're separated. But listen to this. Verse 15, chapter 1. But when he who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me. This is why he didn't argue. Saul of Tarsus, dude, could probably argue with God based on the Old Testament. When God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, was pleased to reveal his son in me, that I might proclaim him in the nations. I might proclaim him to combine Galatians and Colossians. I might proclaim the mystery hidden from the foundation of the world, but now being manifest and proclaim Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, if I did not know that, if I did not know that I would never meet a human being in whom Jesus had not found his way inside of his darkness, I would never open my mouth. You want to know why preachers are exhausted and churches are exhausted? It's because if you don't know that Jesus is in people and you're not asking them to ask Jesus that, you have to convince them. And then you have to keep them convinced. Or if you choose entertainment to get your numbers, you've got to keep the entertainment ante up. The New Testament church exploded because the apostles proclaimed Jesus Christ has become flesh inside of you and your flesh inside of your darkness. Ask him. What do you think happens inside a human soul? What do you think happens inside of Adam and Eve? Inside of Saul of Tarsus? Inside of me? When I say, Jesus, are you in me? And we hear, I am. That's the end of religion. That's the end of every ism. That's the end of black, white. That's the end of male, female. That's the end of foreigner, home per. That's the end of denominationalism. Our mission as the Christian community is to proclaim Christ in you, the hope of glory. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. Our mission is not to convince people. Our mission is to bear witness to that which is true, knowing that the Holy Spirit will bear witness with their spirits that it is true, and that Jesus Christ himself, the great I am, God himself will witness inside of their own souls, yes, I am. And so are you. And this is who you are. And I'm bringing you to know that in that day you will know that I'm in my Father and you're in me and I am in you. And you have a place to live now that is greater than the voice and the condemnation of your mom and your dad and your system. You have a place inside where you can hear me speak. That is your manna. Go there. In the, in the, in the Patmos story, at the end, John, G, I mean, Aiden doesn't want to leave. As you can well imagine, he knows the Holy Spirit's leading him back. And, and he says, but what do I do? What do I do? I don't know how to walk in Jesus like you do. And, he, and John says, you've seen me every morning. I rise. 
I listen until I hear his I am. Abide. Abide. As we abide in Jesus, we get to feel what Jesus feels. We get to know his security, his hope, his, his joy. We get to know his father and like my son, his buddy, we get to share in Jesus' relationship with his father. And let me tell you, no religion on earth can produce that. No religion on earth can produce a clean conscience in you and me. We get to share in Jesus' clean conscience. We don't have to sit there like this thinking, I sure am glad I got in, sure am glad I got in. No, Jesus says that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. Jesus turns us this way. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Guess what word is used there? No one pros. No one turns toward the Father face to face but in me, sharing in my mind, in my conscience. And we get to see what Jesus sees and it does something inside of us that nothing on earth, no committee, no synod, no amount of religious performance can ever create. It's just simple. It's called parousia, unearthly assurance. And we get to live in the freedom to play with the Father, Son, and Spirit. That is the light of the world. That is what everybody on earth is wired to live from and see and believe. That's what we're all trying to create in all of our isms that's not working. And now, blessedly, we're all learning it's not working. And Jesus is saying, no, stop. Stop, 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 stop. I've taken this whole thing on my shoulders. I found my way inside your darkness all the way to the place where he cites Psalm 22 because he's identifying with you and me in the psalmist where he gets to that place where you cannot see. He can no longer see the Father's face. He can no longer sense the Holy Spirit's presence and Jesus says, but I trust and I know and I call out to you and I, into your hands I commend my spirit. It's in that place that the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit has pitched its tent inside of you. And we can hear Jesus. We can hear him. This is the proclamation. I am in you and you're in me, and I did that. Ask me if it's true. But what else is more important on any given morning in the world than us asking Jesus if it's true? And if we can't hear him say I am, we ask him why we cannot hear. And when I've asked Jesus why I cannot hear, one, one of the scariest things is because you've agreed your whole life that you can't hear me speak. You learned that in church. God doesn't speak anymore. He's given us these words in the book. Holy Spirit doesn't operate anymore. That's the conversation we should have on Sunday morning. I need to hear Jesus. I cannot hear Jesus. Would somebody pray for me and help me understand? And you'll begin to see these agreements that we made that we're not supposed to be able to hear him. You'll begin to see your self-pity. Because in self-pity, it's really difficult to hear him clearly. Brad's got some teaching on this that he does when he takes his shoes off. It's really funny. I don't know if it's true, but it's funny to watch him do it. <laughs> About self-pity and self-loathing and, and accusation and how we listen to other voices. But my message to you today is that from the foundation of the world, the Father, Son, and Spirit dreamed of you and me by name, by person. Couldn't wait for us to get here. Knew that all of this was going to be in the dark. Jesus was appointed as our good shepherd before the foundation of the world. He is the lamb slain before the creation of the world, the cost uh, that was going to be paid to draw us into this and bring us to the place to where we're not ashamed of ourselves, Jesus knew was going to be on him and he knew that his Father and the Holy Spirit would not abandon him because this circle doesn't do abandonment. This is the most stable circle in the universe. So the whole incarnation is not just Jesus coming, it's Jesus in his communion with his Father, in his anointing in the Holy Spirit, submitting himself to the human race all the way down to the very bottom and one of the reasons we can't meet him there, I think, at least it's been true for me, and this is Aiden's story in the Patmos, one of the reasons he could not meet Jesus inside of his own soul was because he was unwilling to look at his brokenness. That's where God dwells, in our craft. 
And we can't look there because we're afraid that that's all there is to us. So I'm not going there. Most people that go to counseling, statistically, very few people do, but most that do, go because they want proof that the problem is their spouses. We want proof to blame. You cannot look at yourself and your issues until you know that at the core of your being sits this circle, Father, Son, and Spirit. Now I can realize that all my issues are enemy to me living out of his I am in that freedom. But if we're unwilling, and Aiden was unwilling, he could not go there, he could not look there. He just kept that all covered in a little nice garbage can while he did his churchianity, and then he died, dying. And John helps him say, I'm, I can look in there because when I look way in there, down at the bottom, that's where Jesus is. And he brought his Father and the Holy Spirit with him. We're living at a point in history where this is all coming back around. This is not new. This is not even 500 years old. This is not even 2,000 years old. This is eternal. This is the eternal truth that's being lived out. And Jesus is saying, take sides with me, listen to me, Ask me, get together and talk to each other. Why can't we hear and then live in the joy of hearing me? Live in, live, share in my joy and let that light shine in this dark world. That's the way we defeat religion. We outshine it in our freedom to be. Amen.